Okay, so uh, hi again. Uh, today we'll be discussing uh, lecture seven. This lecture is uh, mainly about two things. One is uh, the vanishing gradient problem. And uh, once we're done with that, we'll be discussing a uh, few variants of recurrent neural networks. I, I, I was not able to host uh, the, the last weekend uh, meetup. So in the, in the meetup before that, we went through lecture six in which uh, we discussed recurrent neural networks. So this lecture will be uh, a continuation for that. So this is what we'll be, uh, we, we'll be doing in this lecture. We'll be talking about uh, the problems that we have with recurrent neural networks and how to fix them. That is how to fix vanishing gradient. And then we'll be uh, going through some, some recurrent neural network variants like LSTMs and GRUs. So besides vanishing gradient, we have another problem, which is exploding gradient as well, which is uh, like the opposite of vanishing gradient problem. We'll be uh, very briefly looking into that as well. So you, if you have gone through the lecture or attended the previous previous meetup, you must be familiar with this sort of structure. So this is nothing but uh, this is how a simple recurrent neural network structure looks like. Each rectangular red box that you see is uh, is a cell or a hidden state. Here we only have one output. Uh, out, uh, in this figure here, they are only indicating the output for the last recurrent unit. Depending on the problem that you're trying to solve, you might need an output state for every timestamp, or you might only you, you might as well uh, do it with just one. To give an example, for an example, uh, when you, when the use case is something like sentiment analysis, you wouldn't really need an output state for every input state. It's because your neural network or your model has to go through the entire ex entire sentence or example and then say whether it's positive or negative. Now let's compare com comparing that against another example, like uh, let's say translation. In that case, maybe we, we might need uh, one, one output cell for every input cell. Even in that case, we might, uh, the, the, that, that again could be done in two ways where you have uh, one, every word which is being generated on the fly for every input word, like, for every input word in English, let's say your model is model has to generate uh, its its equivalent in some other language like German. So that's that's one example. So what what exactly is vanishing gradient? Here, uh, using the same previous example, we have uh, four hidden states here, and we here j j four theta is nothing but the uh, the loss that is calculated for this hidden state. And now we have to back propagate. All the learning happens through back propagation. Here, W represents the weight vectors. So the, the same letter is used for every, on top of every arrow. This indicates that the same weight matrix is being used here. Unlike the previous examples or uh, when it comes to images and other, other kind of data like uh, the regular convolution neural networks where the weight matrix changes from one layer to another. Here in recurrent neural networks, we, we use the same weight, which we, we more formally call shared weights. So how, how does the weight updatation work here? So what we have to do is we have all these weights here and depending on the loss that is calculated, we have, we have to back propagate the loss and somehow update each of these weight matrices, each uh, somehow back propagate the error through all of the parameters of the network. So for example, as we can see here, we have uh, the partial derivative of J4 with respect to H1, which means we are trying to calculate here. What we are trying to do here is, how is the error of this network uh, being influenced by H1? Similarly, we have to do that for H2 for H3 and H4. What we have here is all of the, all, each of these components in purple that we have here are the things that, that, that form, uh, that are part of uh, calculating the derivatives. 
So what we can see here is that this again is chain rule. Something it's something which we discussed in detail in one uh, in one of our previous uh, meetups. So now what we want to do here is to calculate uh, the gradients for each of these components. So in order to we can see here that H two is uh, dependent is kind of dependent on H one because as we know in recurrent neural networks for every timestamp we are not only going to take the input for that specific timestamp but we are also going to use the output from the previous previous unit as well which in this case are h1 h2 h3 and h4 so here when we are trying to calculate we know that h2 is dependent on h1 so there are a number of ways to understand chain rule but in this case but to put it simply we know that h2 is dependent on h1 and that's what we have here uh, the the partial derivative of h2 with respect to h1 and then we know that uh, h3 is dependent on h2 that's the and that that that's the term that we have here and the same thing goes for h4 and finally the the loss function j theta for, for this fourth hidden state is dependent on h4 because the output of h4 is going to be passed through a softmax function and the error is calculated here. So now putting all these things together, we'll get our, uh, our uh, gradients. And the way they're calculated is, uh, one important thing that you have to notice here is that all of these individual terms are being multiplied, which means if these, each of these gradient terms are small in magnitude, then multiplying all of them together is going to give us a value which is much, much smaller. So that's what causes vanishing gradient. And that's what it's explained here as well. So when, when each of these terms are small, the gradient signal that gets back propagated, it, it gets smaller and smaller as the back propagation uh, progresses. So that's the problem that we have with vanishing gradient. Uh, vanishing gradient. And it's not just, uh, it's not something that happens with recurrent neural networks alone. It's a problem that, that would happen with other types of architectures as well. We have the problem with the more regular CNNs as well, which is why in ResNets we have uh, skip connections. Even that is discussed in the later part of the lecture. So, the, these, these, the, this is more of a mathematical representation. HD is nothing but uh, sigmoid is the activation function that we are using here. What this, what, what's happening here is that we have, uh, we have uh, as we can see here, if, if we are taking H2, H2 will have uh, two inputs. One is one that comes from the previous unit, which is H1 the h1 will be one of the inputs to h2 and then there will be x2 which is not represented in this diagram but h2 will have two inputs one is the input x2 and uh, the output of the previous unit which is h1 so that's what is happening here we have h of t minus one which is nothing but the output that comes from the previous state and then we have xt here which is the original input at that specific timestamp t, and both of them are uh, are put are put together with their weight matrices, and then we have b1, which is the bias term. So putting all of these things together, we pass it through an activation function, which is sigmoid here, and that's how we get ht. And then when we have to calculate uh, the back propagation, we will be having these terms here, as we have seen here, to calculate uh, the partial derivative of H3, we'll be using H1. So th th this is more of a formal representation of that. So what's important here is that when this WH is smaller, then this term gets smaller and smaller as, as we progress. That's what a uh, vanishing gradient does. So there are two blocks which I felt uh, were really helpful. We will be going through those, which will uh, maybe, which I hope that would give a better idea of this. So, uh, so this, uh, this, this is another interesting observation where, uh, so every hidden, every state in a recurrent neural network can have uh, 
will have its own input unit, its own hidden unit. And as discussed, depending on the problem, it might have an output unit. So now let's say that uh, something that we can notice here is that we have one loss calculated here, which is uh, J2 and we have J4. As we, can, uh, as we can notice in this figure here, whenever we are, when, if we have to update the weights for H1, we see that the loss that is calculated here at J2 might give a uh, better representation or better results when we are trying to update the weights for this rather than J4. And that's because, again, uh, the vanishing gradient, gradient comes into picture here. If the loss is calculated at a very farther step and we are trying to back propagate that, and if vanishing gradient comes in, we'll be having gradients which are much smaller and smaller as we go farther away into the, in, in, into the past uh, timestamps. So that problem can be solved by instead using uh, the signals which are much closer. So here, instead of using J4 to update the weights which are farther away, we can use something like J2 which would give better model weights. So and another way of uh, understanding this is that uh, in terms of language, in terms of text, uh, if you have a sentence with 10 words, you, the word that comes at index three or position three might be required to predict the word that comes at position 10. That may not always be the case, but depending on the kind of text that we're dealing with, the language, and also how long, uh, how long the text is, we might have to look back uh, a certain number of positions to actually predict what comes next. So gradient here, uh, here we can, uh, we can see how, how uh, we can refer to that as a context. So if the gradient keeps on decreasing over longer distances in the, uh, like over past words, then we, 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 we can't say for sure whether uh, the word at position t and t plus one are dependent or not, or whether we have the wrong parameters for our, uh, for our model. So here is an example. So when she tried to print her tickets, she found that the printer was out of toner. She went to the stationery store to buy more toner. It was very overpriced. After installing the toner into the printer, she finally printed her. Now, simply going through this sentence, we can say that uh, the word that comes in this blank is uh, tickets. Now that's easy for us, but how can uh, a model do it? How can a machine do it? Now, for the machine to be able to uh, predict it correctly, it has to somehow map the word that comes here in the blank with the word that is much farther away, which is tickets, which means the model has to somehow contain in, the, in its context or representation that uh, the word that comes here might be dependent on the word which comes here, like the word at the position or the step seven is uh, impacting the word which comes much farther away. So these kind of dependencies are tough to learn when uh, the gradients keep decreasing uh, due to vanishing gradient. So here's an example. Uh, now, this is uh, LM task. LM is nothing but a language model. So the language model does two things. One, it takes a sentence or a group of words and, and gives it gives it a score or some sort of uh, uh, like confidence score saying how probable that sentence is to occur, like how, uh, or, uh, how good it is in terms of the language that, that is chosen. And then it can also be used for uh, predicting the word that comes next. So here, the, the, what the sentence that we have is the writer of the books and we have to predict the next word. Now, Depending on how you see it, there are two, uh, we always try to judge the word that comes next, depending on the words that, ha that we have seen uh, previously. Whether it's, uh, whether we, th th the same thing is, uh, 
is being replicated for the models to be done. So here we know that the writer of the books is, is is the right word that has to come in here. Now that the recency is the word, which means uh, we have to look certain number of words that have come in the past to predict what, what uh, word that comes next. So there are two types of recencies or context that we can say here. One is syntactic, the other one is sequential. So when it comes to sequential, we are simply going to pick the nearest word. If you are doing that, then going by the word books, the next word would be R. Since books is plural, it's appropriate for us to use R. But given the full sentence, the writer of the books, here the blank is more dependent on the word writer than the word books. So the difference here is uh, between syntactic recency and sequential recency. While the sequential recency says that R is the right word, the syntactic recency says that is is the right word. Now, when we are using recurrent neural networks, which uh, have this problem with uh, vanishing gradient, they tend to go with sequential recency than the syntactic recency, which means I want to say that the next word is R rather than is, which is the right word. So now, so far we have talked about vanishing gradient, which is when the gradients keep decreasing and they get smaller and smaller. Now the opposite of that is also possible where the, gradient, the gradients keep exploding or they, get, uh, they start getting bigger and bigger. Now, uh, so what, what happens once we have the gradients calculated is that uh, we have the learning rate and uh, the calculated gradient is multiplied by that learning rate. Now let's say, uh, so with, 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 with what all we discussed so far, let's say we have a gradient which is very small and then we are multiplying that with the learning rate. Learning rate itself is a very small is a very small number, which means all of this term here is going to be very small when the gradient is small, which means the weight update that's going to happen is very small. Uh, so if you started with some random weights and if you are using very small gradient updates, you're not really going to see much learning your weights are not going to differ much. So, which means that is actually leading to bad learning or bad updates. And though it doesn't really uh, cause a lot of, though it doesn't really uh, lead to bad performance, what it does is it is going to take uh, a lot of time to train your model. And uh, so uh, that's with vanishing gradient. I, I think I uh, mixed up things here. So what happens when, we, when the gradient is small is that uh, the weights here are going to be updated and we are going, the theta nu is going to be much, uh, is going to be big, which means you're taking two big steps. So you must, you must have uh, come across this curve of the loss function where in whatever course that you have taken, you must have seen the steps that are being taken. So when with exporting gradients, what happens is your model takes two, uh, two large steps, which means the weight updates are not happening uh, the right way. So that would lead to infinite or uh, an N in your model, which is not good. So to overcome that, we can use gradient clipping. So gradient clipping is when you're setting some sort of limit for the weight updates. Uh, that's what this pseudocode uh, represents here. So here you're calculating the gradient and then you're somehow saying if it is greater than a certain threshold value, you're kind of clipping it, you're kind of scaling it down. That way you're not allowing your model to have uh, weight updates which are greater, which are bigger than a certain threshold value. So that's one way of, uh, so gradient clipping is uh, really helpful there. So this is one example with and without clipping. What we see on left is that we have certain, we have a model that is, uh, we have weight updates that are taking several small steps. Then from there we have one big weight update. And then from there we have another big weight update, which is not really ideal. And this is what happens when there is no gradient clipping in place. And then we have this, the same plot on right, where we, with clipping, we see that the weight updates are much proper they're not going all over the place. 
So the problem with vanishing gradient is that it makes it difficult for the RNNs to preserve information or to remember things in their context, which are actually necessary for them to, for, to, to accomplish their task accurately. So this is what we have uh, in a very simple RNN, the hidden state HT, again, we're repeating the same thing that we discussed earlier. So the hidden state is nothing but uh, we have this weighted inputs, the inputs as we know for RNN R2, which is the actual input XT and the output from the previous state, which is HT minus one. And we are, uh, we are taking the weighted inputs and then we are passing them to an activation function. That's what forms HT. Now this is, uh, though this, this works, when we want to preserve some sort of uh, past information, this doesn't really work well. So if you remember, apart from this, if we remove one of these input terms, this is what we have in the regular convolution neural networks. The weighted inputs plus bias, they are passed through an activation function. That works for uh, image kind of data, because when you're training a model for uh, things like classifications, you don't really want your model to remember the previous input. Like if the previous input is dog, the next input would also be dog when you're having some sort of dog versus cat classifier. Or even if the current image is different from the previous image, that information is not really required for the model to classify dogs and cats. But in this case with language and in some other uh, related tasks, you have to retain some information about the previous, uh, previous data. So that is why we need a more sophisticated or complicated uh, hidden state. So that's what uh, LSTMs provide. So in addition to the hidden state HT that we have here, LSTMs have uh, a, another state called cell state. Now this is where uh, they primarily differ from the regular RNNs. So, we will be uh, reading all about, we'll be going through all of these in the blogs uh, by Christopher Ola, which is very good. So this, this is some uh, math and formula uh, behind uh, LSTMs. So what, what happens in LSTMs is that instead of having a simple hidden state, you have these sort of gates which control the information retrieval and uh, updation. So um, I will skip this part for now as we'll be uh, going through these in details in the blogs. So this is taken from the same blog that I'm referring to. Uh, we, we'll see which things there. These are some of uh, the tasks where LSTMs are used, like handwriting recognition, speech recognition, machine translation, image captioning, etc. And uh, with transformers and other architectures that have come uh, in the past couple of years, uh, now uh, they're also being used for uh, many other sophisticated tasks. So gated recurrent neural network, gated recurrent units is very similar to LSTMs, except that it doesn't include a separate uh, state in addition to the hidden state. So there is no cell state here. The same hidden state, instead of being totally overwritten, it, it gets updated or reset uh, at every state. So what happens here uh, in uh, the regular RNN is that uh, at every input state, we see that the hidden input, so we have H1, we have, uh, we have H2 here, which is using H1. Uh, so which means whatever the information that we have in H2, is, uh, is dependent on H1 and the input uh, that H2 receives, which is X2. So this cell, uh, this hidden state information is, is totally being overwritten by uh, overwritten. But uh, when it comes to LSTMs, what we have is uh, we have hidden state, and then we also have something called, uh, we have the CT here. So hidden state represents all of this. And then we have a CT, which contains some sort of information from the previous uh, cells, and uh, which is not totally overwritten, but it gets updated accordingly. 
so coming to the LS, uh, GROs don't have a separate cell state. They only have one hidden state, which means uh, they're reducing, uh, they, they come with fewer parameters than LSTMs. So there is a rule that, uh, that is mentioned here. It, it's good to start with LSTMs, but if having more efficiency and performance is of necessity, maybe then we can switch to GRU. So vanishing gradient or exporting gradient is, uh, it, it's not, uh, the problem is not just in RNNs, we have it in other neural network architectures as well. So the figure here is uh, taken from ResNet. Uh, ResNet is, is a quite popular uh, scene in architecture. So what we have here is we have an input X, and then we have a regular layers like weight layer, we have an activation layer, ReLU, and then we get uh, the output out of these layers, which is f of x. And now uh, f of x will be then transformed to other layers in in uh, the more in normally. That's what happens. But here, what we have is we have a skip connection that connects from x to f of x. So this way, the the uh, the information of x is uh, being retained here. So this helps both in information preservation and also at the time of back propagation, these script connections help in avoiding uh, overcoming vanishing gradient problem. There are other architectures which uh, like dense nets. So here in uh, ResNet, what we have is we have a script connection that connects the input from one layer to the output of that layer. Whereas in dense net, everything is connected to everything else. So there is something like highway connection as well. I uh, I never really uh, look. I never really digged into it, but maybe uh, maybe I, I might do it sometime. Um, so uh, this uh, we have other uh, vari variants for RNNs, which is bidirectional RNN. So to give an example. The movie was terribly exciting. Now, if you if you are trying to build a model to give uh, a sentiment for this sentence, if uh, for every let's say the movie was terribly exciting, if at every timestamp we are only considering uh, what we have seen before, then there is every chance that uh, when it comes to by the time the model comes to terribly. And if it doesn't have the context that comes later, the model might think that it is negative. But only if the model can look not only what comes before, but also what comes later, only then it will be able to say that it's, it's, a, positive, it's a positive sentence. So how can we do that? It's not possible with this sort of uh, architecture, but by using something like this, which is called bidirectional RNN, we can say that it's, uh, it's a positive statement. So how, how bidirectional RNN work, works is this. Here, the, we have forward RNN. We have two RNNs here. One is forward RNN and backward RNN. In terms of structure, each of these two are similar to what, uh, what regular RNN looks like. So think of all of these red, uh, red cells. So these represent forward RNN, which means the sentence is travels from left to right, like how we normally read it. The movie was terribly exciting. And then we have another RNN that, that travels is from right to left, which means exciting terribly was movie the. So what happens is that each, each timestamp, each of these hidden states are concatenated. Here for the word terribly, this will contain only the representation for the words that have come before terribly, but nothing about the words that have come after. But here, what happens is for the same word terribly, we have a representation that comes from the words that, that are before terribly and also the words that come after terribly. So this way, the model gets information on uh, information from both sides instead of uh, just the words that we have seen previously. So this again is another uh, kind of RNN where uh, 
instead of having one layer hidden states, we have several layers. In this example, we have three. And each of these hidden, uh, hidden layer cells are connected to the hidden layer cells that come in the next timestamp. Time stamp. So this is all from the slides. We will now go through the, through the blogs. So before that, if anyone have any questions or if anyone wants to add anything, I think you can do that now. I will quickly stop sharing the slides and share the blog. Okay, so this is a blog that I was referring to. Before we go to this, uh, let me quickly show you this. This is something that we, uh, that we went through in one of the previous meetups. What we have is we have an input layer here, I1, I2. And then we have, this is a sim very simple neural network uh, with one in input layer, one hidden layer, and one output layer. So we have an input layer with two neurons, a hidden layer with two neurons, and an output layer with two neurons. W1 till W8 are the weights, which means these are the parameters that we have to learn. They are randomly initialized to some values. And then after every feed forward phase, calcul after calculating the error, these weights are updated. So more or less the same thing happens with uh, RNNs as well. So, uh, so this, uh, this is another representation of an RNN. What we have here is we have each uh, input x1, x2 till xk, and each of them uh, is weighted. Like we have a wx and wc, which are the weight matrices, which means these are the parameters that have to be learned by the model. And for what we see in, in orange, each cell that has a tan h is our hidden state. So tan h here, the first one on the left is calculated using uh, the weighted input wx x1. Though it's not represented here, for the for the first for the first input state, we are going to have uh, a default hidden state that comes from here. Normally, it it could be initialized to zeros or it could be randomly initialized, and uh, that could be learned along with the other parameters as well. So coming to this here, x2. When it comes to the timestamp two, the input is x2, and that is weighted by wx. And here, tan h is calculated using c1, which is nothing but the output that comes from the previous state that's weighted with wc. So here, x2 and c1 will be the inputs to this uh, hidden state. Now, and finally, what we have is hk, which is the output from this, uh, from this network. And uh, what we are trying to do is uh, we calculate the error at here uh, by passing this through a softmax function and uh, calculating the error. Now what we have to do is we have to calculate, uh, uh, we have to do the back propagation, which means we want to know how this error function changes with respect to the weights. This is what we want to know. Now, once let's say that we have calculated that term, and then what we have to do is the weight matrix has to be updated. How do we do that? We take the gradients that we have calculated and that is being multiplied by a learning rate alpha. And then this term is being subtracted from the previous or the original weight matrix that we have, which are initially, uh, which are randomly initialized in the beginning. Now, what we see here is an expansion for that, uh, for this. So, there is a little bit of math here, but again, everything everything boils down to chain rule. Uh, so we have we are trying to calculate uh, the, the partial derivative of the error with respect to the weights, and uh, using chain rule we get this. So one thing that you have to uh, understand here is that. Um, 
so vanishing gradient uh, besides uh, is dependent on the kind of act activation functions that we use now here uh, as it's mentioned here so when k is large so think of think of this here we have pi t t2 till k and this this is repeated till k so when k is very large uh, we see that uh, the last x, this one it, it it tends to vanish which means we will be having the vanishing gradient problem because the activation function that we have used here is tan h so as k keeps on increasing this act, this function gets smaller and smaller or uh, it it uh, tan h which is equal to 1 the derivative of tan h is equal to 1 so what happens is if for bigger values of k the derivative of this activation function it keeps on decreasing so let's say when when k is uh, large enough what happens is this term totally tends to zero and when this is zero which means the weight updates are more or less not actually happening so when this is zero we are multiplying learning rate with a value which is very much close to zero which means this entire term will be zero and weight updates will be more or less the same like uh, even after certain step and certain epoch the weights are going to be pretty much the same pretty much the same which means the model is not really learning much now let me go back to christopher Ola's, uh, blog uh, so if you if we ignore this loop for a while what we have is a simple neural network we have an input xt we have one hidden layer represented by a and then we have this output layer now the loop here is what makes this different the loop here is what makes this a recurrent neural network so once we expand the loop this is the structure that we have we have an input x0 and for that we have an hidden we have uh, this hidden state and we have the output that comes out of this and when it comes, when we go to the next input, x1, again, we are calculating its hidden state, but this time we are, uh, we are also taking the output of the previous state here, which is represented by this arrow. So this is how it keeps on going. So we discussed uh, all the problems that come with this sort of simplified or uh, very simplistic uh, recurrent neural network architecture. What we need is something which is more, uh, which is a bit more sophisticated, something which can remember the long-term dependencies. So here, when you're trying to, let's say, you're trying to predict a word here for the input x3, and maybe knowing what comes at x0 and x1 might suffice. But in another example like this, when you're trying to predict the output of xt plus one, you might need something, you might need some input that has come much, much before, like here which is much farther away. So RNNs don't really work that well for these kind of, uh, for these kind of situations where the long-term dependencies has to be, have to be retained. And that's where LSTMs come in. So this is what we have uh, in, in a simple RNN. So we are getting the input from the previous hidden state, which is represented by this arrow here. And then we are getting the, uh, another input from the actual input xt and both of them together are concatenated and they are passed through an activation function and that forms the output of this timestamp which is passed to the next hidden unit or the next uh, computational unit so now what happens in lstms is that we can see already that this very simple internal component is replaced with something which is which is a bit more complex. So we'll, we'll see what each of these uh, thing does. Uh, so here, uh, this, is, this is what we have. In addition to the hidden state, we also have another state here, which is represented by CT. So let's walk through each of these components. So what we have here is, uh, a forget gate 
So this is called uh, a forget gate layer. Now uh, think of uh, a simple example uh, where you you are using some uh, somebody's name like Alex is in class. Now when you're saying something about him in the follow in in the sentences that come that follow, you might you you may not necessarily use his name again. You might uh, use a pronoun. Alex is in class and he's studying computer science. So here, uh, for the model to know whether to use uh, he or she, the model has to know whether, uh, the model has to know the gender of the person. Is it, uh, is it a male or is it a female? So depending on that information, it has to pick up the pronoun accordingly. So what forgetgate does is it says uh, what information to keep. So it the output of that is between zero and one, zero and one, which again is a score. So if the output is one, it means that whatever the information that comes into this gate, keep it. Just let it go as is. Don't make any changes. If the output is zero, it represents that okay, we don't need any information. So when does that happen? Again, going back to the same example, Alex is in class, he's studying computer science. And we have something that comes next, like saying, uh, maybe Helen is also in the class. She's, she also studies computer science. Now here, the model has to switch from, uh, from the pronoun he to she. Now, which means there is a little bit of uh, forgetting that has to be done. So that's one example here. That's what uh, is done by the forget gate layer. So what, what will be the input for that is here, as we can see in the diagram, the input for this, uh, for this gate FT is nothing but the input XT and the input from the previous cell, which is HT minus one. And both of those, uh, they, uh, they are concatenated together. And then we have a uh, weight for this pocket layer WF and a bias BF. So all of this, uh, this, put together is passed through an activation function sigmoid, and that will be the output of FT. So next we have another uh, other layer called input layer. So the input gate layer decides like uh, which values have to be updated. So here, uh, now, uh, in a sentence, when something is changing, like in, in from the previous example, when the gender is changing, so that has to replace the old one. So that that thing that is being added here by the input layer. So as we can see here, in addition to all of these, we have this CT here, this continuous big line. So this is the entire information that we get from the previous layer. So depending on what we are forgetting and what we are learning and what we are adding, CT gets updated as well. That's what we see here. CT is being uh, uh, updated here. Um, so all so once we have uh, each of these things, we see that uh, CT, which is uh, here, we we are taking what the computations from the forget layer FT, and that is being multiplied with uh, the previous. Uh, cell state CT minus one. And then we also have an input layer, uh, input gate IT, uh, and another uh, layer here, which is CT. So all of these things are put together and that helps us in updating CT accordingly. So these, this, uh, these are all the computations that happen inside each LSTM cell or hidden state. So, here we have some other uh, variants of LSTM where uh, just even to, to see from the diagram here, the input, the inputs that we have here, XT and HT minus one, they're only passing through each of these gates, the forget gate, the input gate, but they're not directly passed to the cell state CT. But in some of the variants of uh, LSTM, we see that uh, the the input is also passed uh, to here, so that is one variant of uh, LSTM. So something else that I wanted to show. So this block here has uh, has some explanations for uh, how the back propagation works. 
for LSTMs, how chain rule works. I'll be sharing this link in the channel uh, so that it might help you all. Uh, so I think I finished going through what all I had for today. So we are now open for any discussions or questions. So using the LT, excuse me, LSTM, it does a lot yeah. more than just uh, give you varied weights. Like it, it varies the weights because you have weights for the forget let, forget gate and all those other different parts, but it does more than just vary the weights. But varying the weights is helpful in trying to remove the vanishing gradient problem. Is that right? Yeah. So in a, in a simple RNN, we see that we have shared weights. So it's like the same things are being reused again and again. So what happens in a hidden state of a recurrent neural network is that everything gets overwritten. Whereas here, the LSTM's hidden states are going to decide like what information has to be kept and what information has to be forgotten. And they do that with the help of all these weights that come with each of these gate layers. Okay, thank you. Are there any other questions? And uh, did anyone get a chance to look into assignment three or work on it? Okay, so I, I have worked through it. Oh, hi, Mandar. Uh, okay, so how how, how was it? Uh, like, I didn't get a chance to work on it yet. Would, uh, it seemed pretty straightforward. It did take me uh, uh, most part of a weekend. Okay. So would but, would you like? Yeah, yeah. Please go ahead. Um, uh, I think it, it was much simpler than the, uh, it seems simpler than uh, second homework. Sure. So would you like to like uh, maybe uh, discuss with us in, in the next meetup if possible? Will that work? Uh, yeah, yeah, I think I can. Sure, okay. So for the next week, maybe then we can uh, start with uh, the assignment discussion and then depending on how we are with time, we can go with lecture eight. Yeah, I, I don't think it will take the entire part, so maybe we should have something else planned. Sure. So I, I'll be uh, going. I'll be taking up a lecture eight once you are done with uh, the assignment. Okay. Yeah, and uh, just uh, so on October. Yeah, I'll not. I'll not be able to host the meetup on October fifth. Like it's like a few weeks away. I just wanted. Uh, to know if anyone would like to host uh, the meetup on October 5th. I, I'll drop a message in the channel as well, uh, so that people who are not on call right now, uh, they might chip in if they're interested. So uh, next week, you can still start the call, right? Because uh... yeah, yes, uh, I will. Okay. Uh, I I'll be there. <laughs> it's it's just on October fifth. Uh, I'll be traveling and I will not be able to uh, host the meetup. October fifth it is, but uh, it's it's still a few weeks away, so that's not a problem. So, is there anything else that uh, anyone wants to discuss? Does anybody know like uh, 
do people use do people still use uh, RNNs or is everything transformers now? You mean uh, the regular RNNs versus the more recent? Uh, no, any for any any form of RNNs like uh, LSTM, GRUs, anything is fine. But has any has everything been replaced by transformers? Uh, as far as I know, I mean, I may not uh, have a lot of expertise to answer that, but as far as I know, I think LSTMs are still being used. Because I think research-wise, everything is transformers. <laughs> yeah, but I think it's going to take some time, uh, you know, to, to move totally away from LSTMs, especially I think for the time series data. So the coming weeks, I think we have uh, attention uh, Q and A, natural language generation. So I think we'll be having more uh, practical based discussions than theory. Oh. So yeah, so if there is nothing else for now, uh, I'll be sharing the links uh, in the channel. So if you have any questions or if you found any useful links or resources, please do share them in the channel so that uh, everybody else can go through them as well. And uh, thank you all for joining. Uh, thank you, Mandar, and uh, see you all next